Man, we're so glad you're here. And wasn't that a powerful song? Yeah. There's something like the gifts of music and lyrics just uh, can put things in such a right perspective. You see, it's us who call ourselves failure. It's us who call ourselves like all these other things. But it's God who calls us his child. And he's made that so through his son, Jesus. And, and so today, like if you're feeling less than that, I want to let you know that there's something powerful about a father's love that he sees beyond all of that, and he loves you. And so today, if you are in desperate need of that, and I think we all are, I just want to remind you that God loves you. And what you may be going through is, is not like good, and it might not be his best, but it can be if you'll just turn your life over to him. Uh, just a couple things, and then we're going to dive into this sweet thing that we're calling the come back. Uh, if you helped yesterday, yesterday we had a great time. And I would tell you that oftentimes uh, serving isn't very fun. And uh, let me just give you an example of that. Like yesterday we weeded around this thing for, uh, for uh, this church for like two hours. Weeding for two hours. Like in Colorado that'd probably be a lot of fun. But uh, <laughs> not here in Wyoming. Just saying. Just saying. Yeah, cleanse your mental palate after that one, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're joining us online, please don't click off, man. You just hang with us, all right? Okay, here we go. We're going to get into the comeback. And, man, we, uh, we are in this middle of this series. And the reason that we're doing this series is that everybody, everybody experiences setbacks. And I bet that in some area of your life, there's probably a setback going on. Or maybe you're on the backside of that deal. And I want to let you know that we're always coming back from a setback. And uh, my heart has just kind of been blue leading for this thing and over this thing, especially what we're going to talk about today. And I want to let you know that if you find yourself in the middle of a setback, that there is going to come a day when God makes all things new, when he rights all wrongs, when he brings us into his presence. That's God doing that. But until then, we are going to experience some setbacks. And so when we have some setbacks, we're all, in search of a, we're all in search of a comeback. And what if there were some things that we could have identified that would actually plunge us into a setback? If we could identify some of those things, then maybe we wouldn't be so prone to slip or fall. And today we're going to talk about a setback that is the worst of them all. And I, I don't even know if I want to use the word worst. Uh, it's the most dangerous of them all. It's oftentimes the most subtle one. It's the core of all the other setbacks. What I would tell you is, what we're gonna, this is the best way to put it. Today, we're going to talk about the granddaddy of them all. The granddaddy of all setbacks. This is the big enchilada. This is like from what all the other setbacks come from. And the setback that we're going to talk about today, if you're taking notes, speaks to a relational disconnect with God. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands or anything like that. But have you ever been in that season where you just felt like you were disconnected from God? Have you ever been going through this season where you just find yourself and you feel like you're all alone and you're wondering like where God is? Here's the crazy part about this setback. Is this not him who's moved? It's us. We're the ones who have moved. And God is so good. He's so loving. And so today, we're going to look at this thing. We're going to talk about coming back from this setback of a relational disconnect. And what I'd love for you to do is I'd love to just show you this example and love to talk about it with you a little bit today. Uh, turn in your Bibles with me, uh, if you would, to 1 Kings. And... Um, God has chosen to use kings to lead his people. The people of Israel have asked for kings. And you can, um, you can start in verse 16, and then we're going to hop over to one of my, my favorite comeback stories. It's one of my all-time favorite comeback stories in the scriptures. But it starts as a setback, and the setback, spoiler alert, is a relational disconnect with God. And, um, but we, what we read is, is that David is gone and Solomon is gone. And during Solomon's reign, because Solomon doesn't finish well, God's going to take his kingdom. Now remember, he brought his people in Israel. He brought them as one nation into the promised land. But because of the king's unfaithfulness, because of, because of the unfaithfulness of the leaders, God's going to divide his kingdom. 
And there's going to be a southern kingdom that consists of two tribes, and, there's going to be, and that's going to be known as like the kingdom of Judah. And then you've got this northern tribe, and that's going to be called the kingdom of Israel. And you just read in the book of Kings, king after king after king after king. And typically, most often what you read is that so-and-so did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And we're going to read today in First, uh, First Kings chapter 16. I think it's going to come up on the screen. We're going to meet a guy named Ahab. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. So he's king. He did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. How would you like that for your title? Hey, guess what? You're going to make it in God's word. Yay! But for all the wrong reasons. Like he did, he did more than all, he did more evil than all the kings who were before him. You see, it was the king's job to lead people in pursuit and worship of God. And what we're learning about Ahab is he is not leading. He is not shepherding. He is not leading people well. To keep that up, and let's just go on, and because it gets even worse than that. I think verse thirty-one, and it says, "Listen how listen how the author writes." He goes, "And as if it had been not a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam." And man, you guys should go through and read this because it's absolutely fascinating. We don't have time, but he walked in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and he took his wife Jezebel. Jezebel came from Lebanon, and she worshipped pagan gods. She was a daughter of Ethabal, king of the Sidians, and they worshipped this god named Baal, and Baal was like god of the thunder, god of skies, and he basically what Baal said is, I want you to live and be prosperous and be happy, and so this is who is leading God's people, and God, and, and they've turned the people's hearts away from God. And so God raises up a prophet because he loves his people. He raises up a prophet named Elijah to be able to speak on his behalf to the people. And if you would, if you just fast forward with me now over to 1 Kings chapter 18, because we're just going to see some things. There's some things I want us to see. 1 Kings chapter 18 starts in verse 16-ish and 17. Ahab went out to meet Elijah. This is going to be God's prophet. He's going to go talk with Elijah. Elijah's coming to meet with him. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? You see, for decades, Israel's been in this downward spiral where they've turned away from God, where they've been worshiping idols and so much more. I'll talk about that in a second. And God's been trying to get their attention. They've been in three years of no rain Now, if you know anything about the scriptures, you know anything about God, rain was a sign of blessing. And he had removed rain from the land. And so everybody in that culture knew it hasn't been raining. Where's God? God's removed his blessing from us. And so it's not rained for three years. And Ahab's blaming it on Elijah, God's prophet. He's like, this is your fault. Listen to what uh, Elijah says. He said, whoa, time out, dude. He goes, I have not made trouble for Israel. I don't think he called him dude, but he could have. He says, but you and your father's family have. So you, you Ahab, and your father's family, you had a relational disconnect from God. You've turned away from God. He doesn't just say turn. He uses a really powerful word. You've abandoned him. Like you've, to abandon is to leave. You've left the Lord's commands. You're not even trying. And you have begun to follow the Baals. That's the next verse. Now, Elijah says, now here's what I want you to do, Ahab. I want you to summon the people from all over Israel. And I want you to meet me on this mountain called Mount Carmel. And I want you to bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Here's what's so funny is you've got an Israel king who's taken a pagan queen and all of these like priests and priestesses of Baal hang out with Jezebel. So Ahab sends word all throughout the 10 tribes, all throughout Northern Kingdom, all throughout Israel. Hold on, if we just go back, he says, let's go and we need to meet Elijah on top of Mount Carmel. Elijah went there before the people and he said, you've got people, you've got generations of people who know what it is. They've, they've heard stories. They've, talked, told, they've told stories. They've heard stories about how God delivered them out of Egypt. They've heard stories of God and David and all the battles and all the victories and all of God's goodness. That is in their history. And this is Elijah's introduction it wasn't like, hey, thanks for coming. It was like, hey, how long are you guys going to waver between two opinions? 
You've been following Ahab, and I'm the only guy in Israel, and he's following, and I'm following God. How long are you going to waver between these two opinions? How long are you going to like be okay with this relational disconnect with God? See, if the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. That's what Elijah says, and look at the response. But the people said, the people said nothing. Why? They are completely disengaged from God. They've completely abandoned him. Like they're in the middle of the setback that we're talking about. They have a total relational disconnect with God. Now I'm gonna keep this rated G because we got some kids in here, but I'm just gonna tell you how did they get there? Well, the first thing they did, and it's the one that we're talking about, it's the granddaddy of them all, they had a relational disconnect with God. They turned from God and they turned to idols. So they started worshiping idols instead of God. And when they started worshiping idols instead of God, what they found themselves doing is things that would make all, that, that should have made them shudder. It should have made them shudder, but it didn't. It should have shocked their senses, but it didn't because they'd already done things that they thought they would never do. They turned from God, they turned to idols, and now sexual immorality is absolutely everywhere. And I'm talking on every level, every level that you can think of. Prostitution, affairs running wild, homosexuality, it is everywhere. And it gets even worse than that. They start sacrificing. You can read about it in 1 Kings. They actually started sacrificing their children to Baal. Baal, they gave Baal like these iron-clad uh, hands, and they would place their children in there and offer them as a sacrifice. It's crazy. See, I told you a relational disconnect was a big deal. It's the granddaddy of them all because when you're disconnected with God, You find yourself doing things you said you would never do. You find yourself doing things you thought, man, I'd never do that. And you find yourself in the middle of that. And so this setback is a really big deal. Why did they they say nothing? Because they are relationally disconnected from God. They have abandoned him. And here's what I love. There was one voice. There was one voice that dared, champ, that dared champion God out of the entire, out of the entire country. And, and here's what, I just wanna, I want us to think about this. Imagine the courage it, it took, and God's with him. But Elijah went in front of the entire nation. He says, how long will you waver? How long will you endure this relational disconnect? Think about the courage of that. To be able to stand before all the nations, the entire people, and say that. And I just think about God loved his people enough to send a voice. And we live in a culture, let's just be honest, our culture is the exact same today as it was in 1 Kings 18. I mean, let me tell you this, to a T. It is the exact same thing. And nobody, nobody, listen, there's God-fearing people still in Israel, and nobody stood up and said, you know, I think Elijah's right. Nobody did that. Nobody said, you know, I've been talking about this. Elijah, keep on going. Bring it, dude. Nobody said anything. It was just like crickets. They They were so disconnected with God and it just totally warped their entire lives. And they've got generations, centuries of knowing the goodness of God and his love and how he's for them. And here they are in this moment of a relational disconnect and nobody attaches their voice to Elijah in that moment and says, I think he's onto something here. It's nothing. You see, his relational disconnect is such a big deal. And... um, I want to talk about some reasons that you and I experience a relational disconnect. I, we could talk all day just about the reasons for it, but you may find yourself, if you're in this setback, you might find yourself this, one of these reasons. Let's just give you three. The first reason is our pace of life. I pick these three because I think that they, they apply to us the best. 
It's like our pace of life in America is always go, 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 go. And whenever our pace of life exceeds our ability to keep up, we start throwing things overboard. We start abandoning things. We stop doing things. And what do you think the first relationship to suffer is when, we, when the pace of life that we're living exceeds our ability to keep up? What do you think that first relationship that we dump is? It's oftentimes we disconnect from God. We're like, hey, God, I'll connect with you tonight. I got to go do this. Hey, God, I'm going to try to pray tomorrow. And we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. We start going, 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 and sometimes we even do things in the name of Jesus that he's asked us to, that, that we're like, I'm going to do this for you, and he's never asked us to do it, and before you know it, we've got our tails in a crack because we've just been going our pace of life, and we've disconnected from him. He's like, I never wanted you to do that. I want to have a relationship with you. And when we get that relational disconnect, it just leads to a really big setback in our lives, and we find ourselves doing things that we never thought we would do. Let me tell you another, another reason that we experience a relational disconnect with God. It is called prosperity. Prosperity in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. But if we're pursuing prosperity above pursuing a relationship with God, that's when it becomes a setback. Like when we're seeing this stuff that we really want and that we really want to own and that we'd love to have and we start working so that we can have that and we disconnect from God, that is going to lead to a setback. Like it's our pursuit of these things that can lead to a setback. And it's not just the pursuit of them. Sometimes it can become, sometimes it's the abundance of prosperity in our lives that can create a disconnect, a relational disconnect with God. I'm going to read this passage of scripture, and let's just see if this applies to us. 1 Timothy chapter 6, I think it is, and verse 6 and 8, we did not forget 7. I do have attention deficit disorder, but you can get the general meaning just from these verses right here, and this is really the guts of it. And so it says, true godliness with what? Commitment. Is great. Oh, baby. True godliness, loving him, honoring him, serving him, sacrificing for him, with contentment, saying, man, God, if I have you, I have enough, is what? Great wealth. So if we have enough and let us be with that. I think that all of us in here today, I think that all of us in here have access to some level of food. I believe that all of us in here have some access to more than one outfit. And Paul is saying, let us be content with it. But then how come it is, Mike Fackler, how come it is those of us who have gathered here today or watching online that we're always after, 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 after more stuff? See, it's not bad. Those things aren't bad. It's just the pursuit of. And if you guys want to do something, like if you find yourself relationally disconnected and you'd say, well, it's not pace of life, but that one kind of, that one kind of hurts there, Mike. What I would encourage you to do is give it away. Start giving something away. And if the very idea of giving away what you think you should give away hurts, then you're probably on the right page. But prosperity can be a setback for us. It can be one of those things that how long will you waver is one of those things that leads us to say nothing. It leads us to be silent. Here's a third way that we can experience a, a disconnect with God. Is we feel like God's let us down. And I call it disillusionment. Like you give your life to Jesus, you give your life to God, and you think that your life is going to be a certain way. And the older I've gotten is I've just come to know that if you've never endured a real tough, tough hardship, man, thank God for that thing. Because that is not the norm. Is in this life we're going to have troubles, but Jesus says, I have overcome the world. And we're going to experience things that wage war against our belief that God is good, that God can be trusted, and that God is faithful. And it's in those moments that, that um, we have to remember he's good. We have to look back on all the way he's been good for us. We have to remember that we weren't made for this life alone. We were made to be with him and made to be with him in eternity. But when this disillusionment sets in, we disconnect. We're like, well, if that's how it's going to be, 
I'm not in. And I just, if you find yourself in that disillusioned season today, what I just want to remind you is I want to remind you that God loves you and that he's for you. And even though you're disillusioned, even though you hurt, and I am not in any way, any way minimizing that pain because that pain is so real. But with him, you have hope for a future. With him, you can have peace. With him, you can have joy. But apart from him, none of those things are available to you, and that thing that you're facing will just eat you alive. It will swallow you whole. But these are three things, and, and let me just, let me just, now we're just gonna kind of take it one step further. Let's just see, because when we're relationally disconnected from God, those are ways that we disconnect from him, but there are typically telltale signs that we are, are disconnected from him, that we are in a relational disconnect, and these are gonna be hard. There's gonna be nothing easy about these next few minutes because it might be like looking in the mirror for all of us, for all of us. But there are some telltale signs that you are relationally disconnected from God and, and here's the thing, is it happens, takes absolutely zero effort. You can drift so easy, you can disconnect so easy. But here are three signs that you might be in a relational disconnect, that I might be in a relational disconnect with God. The first one is, our church attendance. Now, in America today, and we are not uh, immune to this, is we have done something to the church that God never intended us to do. We've made it about us. And here's what that sounds like. I don't feel like going to church today. Who's that about? It's about me. It's about self. Is the church ever about self? It's always been about God. Church attendance is a sign, and if your patterns, whether it's with community group or here on the weekends, is sporadic and crazy, or maybe even, even it's wrongly disproportionate proportionate, or misprioritized, and now I'm stepping on those people with specialized athletics, I know I'm stepping on your toes, But when we make it about us, that's not what God intended it to be. And we say other things like, uh, this is how it sounds like, I don't feel like it today. Here's another thing that we, can do, that we say. Um, I'm just not getting what I need anymore. I'm just not getting what I need if you're depending on one hour a week, if you're depending on a 30-minute sermon, if you're depending on Mike Fackler or James Hume or any one of our staff members, it's out of whack. Because 30 minutes is enough to get me through the week. And it's just a sign. You see, the, the, it was never meant to be about us. God gave us his church. We were supposed to be the church. We weren't supposed to make it about ourselves. So here's what I want to just be really clear on. Find a church that you love its mission and what it's about and go there. And I hope that's here. So let me just tell you what we're all about so you can make a decision for yourself. We are all about taking risks to pursue God. Because there are moments when God asks us to do things that feel risky. If you're like, risky is not in the Bible, listen. If you've ever obeyed what he asked you to do, I'm telling you, Elijah felt like it was risky getting in front of everybody, okay? I, I can live with that. We want to take risks to pursue God, which means we are so in tune with him that we can hear his voice, that he asks us for today, awesome, we're going to do it. We're going to take risks to pursue God, and we're going to love people like Jesus. End of game. And if that sounds good to you, awesome. We are so glad you're here. Connect yourself to that. Don't connect yourself to me. Don't connect yourself to James. Connect yourself to God in the mission of the church and what you believe in. Because whether it's this church or whether it's another church, spoiler alert, we're going to let you down. People come to me sometimes, they're like, man, we left this church and we were hurt. And man, today you said something we've never heard before. And you want to know what my first response to them is? Hang on. Because if you're here long enough, I'm going to hurt you. Not because I want to, but because I'm broken. 
Now, this is a little bit of a soapbox, so I want to get back to this thing. Church attendance can be a sign that, um, that there's a relational disconnect. Here's another one. This is going to step on some toes. I, I, there's probably a better word, but I'm going to use the word selfishness. And again, I, I've told you before, and I'll just say it again, just so you know that I'm an imperfect person running after a perfect God. I'm an imperfect person that needs God every bit as much as you do. It's selfishness. Selfishness. And here's how I know that selfishness exists. What did Jesus say? He says, man, if you're going to come after, after me, you must what? You must pick up your cross and do what? Yeah, but he said something else before that. Oh, somebody said it. You must deny yourself. When is the last time you denied yourself anything? You see, following Jesus is about sacrificing His whole ministry, his whole life, his whole love is born out of service and sacrifice. If he were to, if he wouldn't have denied himself, he would have never come. We'd be in the same predicament, but because he loved, he served. Because he loves, he sacrifices. When is the last time that you sacrificed? You go to any conference anywhere. In fact, I was just in a conference. I'll tell you what the hot button is. The hot button in every church circle is how to attract more volunteers. Do you want to know why that is? It's because nobody's denying themselves like, no, I want to do this. I have this. I've got to do this. And there's just like the church is struggling to find volunteers. But I think even worse than that, even worse than that, you guys, is that there are believers in this room today whose spiritual giftings and muscles are atrophying. They have atrophied. They are completely disengaged. And like you've got a gift that this body of believers needs. You've got a gift that this community needs and it's not being used. And I just want to remind you what scripture says. I want to remind you, I think it was James who said this. Faith without works is Faith without works is dead. So if you're sitting here today and you love Jesus, you are uniquely and divinely gifted. And if that gift isn't being used in the church, if that gift isn't being used in the community, that muscle is atrophying and here's what it's saying. That is a symptom of the fact that you are relationally disconnected from God on some level. And there's all going to come this moment when we stand before God and we're going to be like, hey, I went to church. And he's like, man, that's awesome, but that wasn't really the point. I didn't make the the church for you to go to. I made you so because you were the church. That's where we're supposed to be, but it's just a sign. You see, I told you he's the granddaddy of them all. And I know I'm stepping on toes, but I'm just going to, again, full disclosure, stepping on mine too. And I'll tell you the third, the third sign or symptom that you might be relationally disconnected from God is this, is idolatry. And idolatry can be a number of things. We can idol our kids. We can idol sports. We can idol fame, recognition. We can, we can idolize um, sex and money. And we can go on and on and on and on and on. I want to just share this passage of you and or not of, of you, with you, because <laughs> if it was of you, it would be of me too. I pray it would not be the case for any of us. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 15, 8. He says, they, they, they give me lip service. They honor me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's Matthew 15, 8. And why is that? Because idolatry exists in their lives. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're here on Sunday morning singing songs, but their hearts are far from me. They might say my name out in public, but their hearts are far from me. They might even pray in the morning for me to do all these things for them, but their hearts are far from me. It's just science that there's a relational disconnect. If we find ourselves in that setback, I want to remind everybody in here, for every setback, there's a comeback. And so I want us to go back to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18, because the people said nothing. 
And we'd already talked about why they said nothing. And we've talked about why we would have said nothing. But you see, God loves us and God's not done. Like God is giving them a chance to have a comeback. And let's just look at this together. We're going to look at 10, quick, 10 verses quickly, talk about it, and away we go. So if we can throw up, starting in verse 30 on the screen, because if I read from my translation, it'll look different than yours and we won't be reading the same thing. But if I have to, I will. It's like Jeopardy. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Turn your Bibles first. Are you guys in 1 Kings already? Are you guys there? Okay. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30. I'm just going to read through my translation and you guys will get it. You guys, being a tech person is hard. I thank God for them. And so please, when you see those people, thank them. So Elijah says to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him and, he, and, he, and he, he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in absolute ruins. And Elijah took 12 stones. I wish I could talk to you about 12 stones, but it says one for each tribe that descended from Jacob from the word of the Lord. And he says, okay, um, with these stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he dug a trench around it and he prepares this. Now verse 36, fast forward to it. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah steps forward and he prays, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant and have done all these things. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me so these people know that you are Lord and that you are God and that you, God, are turning their hearts back again. See, he knew he was in the setback, setback of a relational disconnect, and I love it. Who is gonna turn them back? The Lord's gonna turn them back. And we'll talk about that. Then fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and it also licked up the water in the trenches. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and they cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah uh, commanded them, I want you to go seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anybody get away. And they seized them and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and they were slaughtered there. So let's just real quick wrap this thing up and we're gonna close our time in communion. So they go from saying nothing and they've got this contest that's gonna be, the, if Baal's God, let him consume the altar, but if God is God, he'll consume the altar. Baal never shows up, God shows up and fire shoots down from the sky. Now I've been working on facial projections all morning in the, in the, uh, in the mirror. If you saw fire rain down from the sky and consume the altar, you'd be like, and I just picture like me and Deacon or me and my buddy Kyle or me and my buddy Chris or Derek or Lane and we're sitting there, that happens. I'd be like this. I'd be, but they wouldn't be there. They'd already be down on the ground saying, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. And I'd be like. But more than fire raining down from the sky, because for every setback there's a comeback, this is what I want to show you. Is God could have consumed them in his anger but he didn't. You see, God always leaves, leads with love. These people had done things that flew in the face of God. They had offended him deeply. I mean deeply. They had probably had conversations like, we don't believe him, we don't even like him. And he could have consumed them in his wrath, but he didn't. He led with love. And when he showed them that, he showed them, he showed them everything he said, I'm God, and I am love, and I am faithful, and I am patient. Come back to me. And he let them know that it was never too late until he took, they, they went home. It's never too late to come back. You see, God is a God of reconciliation, all throughout history, he's been resolving this relational disconnect with him with people. And he's gone to great lengths to make that so, is that he gave his son Jesus so that we could be connected and know that he is God and that he is love and that he is faithful and he is faithful through all generations and he can be trusted with all things. And so this morning, if you find yourself in a relational, and here's what I'll tell you, and then I'll tell you the, four, the last blanks. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> this is it. When God loves us that way, 
when God loves us this way, it evokes a response. When we understand our disconnect and our brokenness and our hearts prone to wander and God responds with love, it always evokes a response. It always evokes a response. One of submission. What did the Israelites do? They fell down on their face. It evokes a declaration. It always revokes a response. No, you're God. And so here are some steps that we can take out of love, out of obedience, out of faithfulness. One, humility. If you want to come back from that relational disconnect with God, it always, 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 always begins with humility. Being honest with yourself and about where you're at in your relationship with God. It starts with humility. And that is submitting yourself to him. And that is declaring that he is Lord. And by doing that, you take the second step, which is just saying, you know what, God? I want to have a relational reset with you. That's the second one. We can hit the relational reset button with God. It is absolutely mind-blowing that God does this with us because we don't give ourselves the same grace, even in church. Sometimes we don't hit the relational reset button when we should because Jesus led the way that way. But we get to do that with God, and if we can do that with him, we should do that for others, but we can do that. And thirdly, we have to eliminate the distractions. You see, if we, if we come to God in humility and if we come to God and we hit the relational reset button, but we don't do anything about those distractions, we're just bound to fall right back into it. So what did the Israelites do? They fell down, they declared God as Lord, and then they went and destroyed and slaughtered all, the, they eliminated the idols, the distractions, those leading them in it. They wiped them out. And they didn't stop there. They would have gone throughout their land and they would have desecrated those things. And so if there's anything, if there's an idol in your life that is creating this disconnect, you have to eliminate that distraction. If there's a relationship in your life that is leading you away from God, you have to eliminate that relationship. You've got to do something about that relationship. You've got to address the issue in that relationship. And that's what I want to say. If it's with a friend, you may have to choose a different friend. But sometimes it's not a friend, it's a spouse. Don't eliminate the spouse. That's not godly. That's why you saw me check up. I was like, Woo! What kind of theology are we preaching around here? You made that decision. And your love for Jesus can make a difference in that spouse's life.